Hello dear chess friend, I'm international master Andrei Ostrovsky and in this lesson you're going to learn the basics of the attack against the uncastled king. First of all, let's try to understand what is so special about the king which is not castled yet. Well, uncastled king occupies either initial position or the one in the center. This area is naturally well accessible, which makes it much easier for attacking pieces to get to the king if compared to the position that the king occupies after castling. To perform the attack against the uncastled king efficiently, you should know some basic principles. Let's discuss them using specific examples. In our first example, white managed to prevent black's king from castling uh, by putting the bishop on a3. Indeed, this bishop controls the long diagonal a3, f8. What is really important that f8 is under control, so black's king cannot castle. And this is basically our first principle. Whenever you have a chance to prevent opponent's king from castling like this, do it. Because obviously, to start the attack against the uncastled king, the king should stay uncastled before you start this attack. So now, uh, how to actually uh, attack the king in this situation? It's usually helpful to identify the vulnerable squares around the king that you can use for this attack. One of these squares is uh, definitely f7, which is protected by only the king, and it is already under pressure because of this bishop on c4. So what if we just add another piece to attack this f7? Indeed, this queen b3 move, uh, simply creating the threat of taking on f7, appears very, very strong. So bishop f7 is not only the threat of just capturing the pawn, it is a threat of a checkmate, because opponent's king is completely limited. So black cannot ignore this threat and has to protect the pawn, which is not that simple in this particular case, because f8 square is controlled, uh, black cannot really play rook to f8, because e7 square is controlled by the bishop, there is no queen to e7 move. Uh, because e5 square is controlled by the knight f3, there is no knight to e5 move. So basically the only defense here that makes sense is d7, d5. And black played d5 in the game. In this case, of course we take on d5 with the pawn. Very strong continuation, because we attack the knight c6. And uh, this means black doesn't have the time uh, to run away with the king or do anything to actually protect it and has to deal with uh, the knight which is hanging. Because if we simply win the material, it's also just good enough to win the game. But what is really important here, and uh, that is the main change in the position after ed5, is that the e-file, which was previously closed, now becomes completely open. There is no longer this pawn on e4, uh, actually limiting our own rook, and this means after a simple move rook to e1, uh, very soon white will start the direct attack against the king. And that is our next principle, very important one. We have to try to actually open as many files and diagonals against the king as possible. Why? Because, well, open files imply that uh, we can attack the king using heavy pieces. Open diagonals mean that we can use our bishops and the queen of course is very good in case of uh, open files and diagonals because the queen can use both files and diagonals to attack the king. So in general the more exposed the uncastled king the better for us. The more pieces we have around the king, close to the king, the better for us. So after ed5 uh, black has to do something not only with the knight on c6, but with the e-file. And at very first glance, knight to e7 looks like very logical continuation because black kind of solves both problems with one move. So first of all, goes away with the knight from the vulnerable position on c6, at the same time covering the e-file. The problem is it doesn't help because white continues the attack after rook to e1, simply attacking the knight on e7. Now obviously black can castle, but after that we just uh, take the knight and black has no compensation for missing material, so white's position is completely winning. The only normal defense for black here is knight f6 to g8, which is super ugly because the knight goes back to the initial position and uh, now prevents black from castling. It's not the only problem though. So white can continue the attack easily by exerting pressure uh, on f7. 
So the simple move knight to g5, which is not the only one uh, that leads to uh, winning position, appears very efficient because now white is ready to open up diagonal a2 g8, which was closed after ed5. So actually to reopen it and reactivate hands the queen and the bishop attacking f7. And black doesn't have the satisfactory defense here. All the pieces are very passive. There is no chance to coordinate them. For example, if black plays bishop f5 here, intending to put the bishop on g6, protecting f7, white already continues with the attack against f7 and just plays d6. After cd6, it's possible to capture an f7 with the bishop, but bishop to b5 check is even better, because in this case, we are going to capture on f7 uh, with the queen, which means very quick uh, checkmate, or winning a lot of material after, let's say, black's queen to d7 move. So after ed5 in the game that we discuss, black decided to put the knight on a5, at least attacking something in white's camp. It doesn't really help. So white continues the attack with the rook e1, which was planned after ed5. It's check, and black at very first glance doesn't have a possibility to uh, cover the king even. So if king goes to d7, white continues with the knight e5. Another very natural follow-up. So another kind of principle is to continue the attack aggressively. So don't make moves wasting the time. If you have a chance to keep on attacking the king, namely uh, given checks and so on, just do it. Because uh, the last time your opponent has to prepare the escape, the better for you. The more chances you have in this situation just to checkmate the king very soon. So 95 check forces the king back because other squares are controlled. And in this case, white can continue with the queen b5 check. So the only chance for black to survive here is to put something on either c6 or d7, but in this case, white continues with a discovered check. So for example, if black plays c6, white simply captures this pawn with the knight. It is checked from the rook e1 again, and at the same time, it is the attack against the queen, so white easily wins this position by capturing the queen next move. So after rook e1, the only chance for black to try to survive it is actually bishop to e6. So this move becomes possible because queen on b3 is hanging, and at very first glance white doesn't have a chance to take the bishop on e6. But this continuation is possible, moreover it appears the easiest way to win the game. So d takes e6, sacrificing the queen, but continuing the attack. Let's have a look at this. Obviously black has nothing better than taking the queen here, because if black doesn't take the queen, this simply means white has not only the attack, but the decisive material advantage. So knight takes b3, and now white takes on f7 with a pawn. And it's a double check. So the king is definitely forced to d7. And what is going on here? So we sacrifice the queen for what? Actually for uh, attack. So we have to keep on attacking the king and uh, actually prove that uh, our sacrifice is justified. Decisions like d takes e6 uh, should be based on concrete calculation. But in such a situation, first of all, it is a very natural idea because, as you can see, we not only open the position completely, we also force the king towards the center, where the king becomes even more vulnerable than on the initial position. Second of all, it's not that hard to find follow-ups, because although we no longer have queen, all other pieces are quite active, and uh, we have possibility to give checks one by one. But we have to be careful uh, finding the follow-up. So we should understand the idea of our opponent in such a situation. So after king d7, for example, the king is going to actually occupy c8 and hide somewhere on b8. So our next check should be the one that prevents it. And uh, we have a choice between knight to e5 check and bishop to e6. In this particular case, of course, bishop to e6 becomes much more logical and much more efficient. Because exactly after this check, there is no king c8 and the king is forced uh, further towards the exposed position. So king goes to c6. All right, now it's time to keep on attacking the king. So knight goes to e5, very natural follow-up. 
uh, pay attention how white's pieces are coordinated so both bishops the knight take part in the attack and black's own pieces actually prevent the king from occupying safe squares now it would be for example very helpful to occupy b6 maybe but b6 is engaged so the king is forced to b5 what is next so now again as we may notice the king is going to occupy something like a6 maybe black is even intended to start with the a5 move and then uh king a6 and king a7 becomes possible so we have to attack the king right now again and it is bishop to c4 check uh, this square as you can see is uh, possible to occupy because the knight on e5 controls it after this move the king has only two squares a5 and a4 and in both cases the king is checkmated for example if king goes to a4 we start with the a takes b3 with check actually uh given the rook a1 the chance to attack the king as well king is forced to a5 and bishop goes to b4 with a checkmate by the way nice fact is that even if there is no rook on a1 it is still a checkmate almost the same happens after king to a5 so we first start with the bishop b4 check and after king goes to a4 we capture the knight with the pawn and it's a checkmate the king is completely limited all white's pieces actually take part in the attack let's summarize the main ideas of this example uh, first of all we have to attack the most vulnerable point in opponent's camp uh, in open games it is usually f7 or f2 depending on the color of the pieces you're playing with second of all we have to try to open up a position as quick as possible to open up files and diagonals because this guarantees the inclusion of all of our resources into the attack also material i mean something like the queen or something it's not necessarily that important so what is really important is the coordination of attacking resources as you can see in this particular case white managed to checkmate the king even without the queen let's have a look at the other example this position looks rather similar but there is a significant difference if compared to the previous example so as we may notice the bishop on a3 prevents the king from castling short but there is also an opportunity for black to castle long and this move is already possible so the factor of time starts playing a decisive role and there is our next principle so we should start the attack as soon as possible so we should be rather quick starting concrete specific attacking operations so the only real chance for white to start the attack here is to use the open e file but at the moment we can notice that there is this bishop on e6 covering the king so we should do something with the bishop to be able to play rook to e1 with check and white's next move is rather natural it is d4 d5 the question is why for example rook e1 is bad so rook e1 is also very logical we prepare d5 but in this particular case it is too slow because black simply castles and d5 no longer makes sense because it doesn't cause uh, any significant damage so d5 immediately is the best option for white and black is in trouble so bishop is under attack uh, there are two options to capture the pawn on d5 or to go away because if black castles then white can include knight to e5 intermediate move attacking the queen and protecting the bishop on d3 which may become a bit vulnerable after d5 takes e6 and after queen goes away uh, we just take the bishop after queen takes e6 we can play for instance rook to e1 and we have extra minor piece and absolutely winning position so after d5 what happens if for example bishop goes to f5 in this case as we may notice e file is ready to use so rook goes to e1 with check and since we control e6 square the bishop cannot go back covering the king we also control e7 square here so that it's impossible for black to play knight to e7 at least it makes no sense we just capture it winning the game uh, having decisive material advantage so the king to d8 is the move here but in this case we just continue aggressive play by putting the knight on e5 uh, very natural follow-up attacking the queen and the pawn f7 simultaneously and since the queen also has to protect the bishop somehow 
white easily wins. For instance, if uh, queen goes to c8, still uh, protecting the bishop on f5, white just continues with the knight takes f7 check, and after only move king to d7, bishop f5 is already a checkmate. If king instead goes to e8, so that protecting f7, uh, well, white can simply capture the bishop on f5 with the absolutely winning position, have an extra minor piece, and continue the attack. What if bishop goes to g4? At very first glance, it makes much more sense than bishop f5, because first of all, bishop is not that vulnerable on g4. Moreover, knight f3 is pinned, so that at first glance, white doesn't have a chance to play knight to e5. Well, in this case, rook to e1 is still very strong, forcing the king to super ugly position on d8, but queen to e1 is even stronger. So it is check, and in this case, as you can see, knight on f3 is no longer pinned, so the next move will be knight to e5. For example, if uh, king goes to d8 just like in the previous line, knight jumps to e5 with the same problem for black, so the queen cannot actually protect both f7 and g4, be not placed on d7, and uh, if queen goes away somewhere, we either take on g4 or take on f7. If instead of that, knight goes to e7, then we anyway play knight to e5, attacking the queen. And once again, there is a problem, because the queen has to protect not only the bishop on g4, but the knight on e7 as well. So if queen goes to c8, let's say we just take the bishop, and here is the threat of just taking the knight on e7 next move with the queen, and it would be a checkmate. So black has no time to recapture the knight on g4, which means white has a decisive material advantage again. So after d5, looks like bishop takes d5 is simply the only move. And after that, it is very tempting to use the e-file immediately, so to put the rook on e1. But this move would be a mistake. Why? Because after rook e1, the bishop simply goes back to e6. And it appears that white achieved absolutely nothing. So prior to occupying the e-file with the rook, it's really vital in this particular case to eliminate the potential defender, uh, namely this bishop on d5. And here is our next principle. So you should think of uh, opponents defending pieces. So you should think about opponents best defending options. And if you have a chance, you should simply eliminate defenders. In this particular case, the main defender is the bishop d5, so why not to capture it? Knight takes d5 appears very strong. So after queen takes d5, because, well, if black doesn't take the knight on d5, once again, uh, white simply has decisive material advantage. So queen takes d5, and there is no longer a possibility to cover the king with the help of bishop e6. So rook to e1 becomes really strong, and it is possible to actually play this right away. But after rook e1, king goes away. So white decided to improve this idea to make it even stronger and started with the bishop b5. And uh, here's another hint. So uh, whenever you want to make your move, although it may look very natural and uh, very strong, just try to think about opponent's best defense. Maybe you have a better option, like here. So bishop b5 is very strong because now after this check, white also attacks the queen on d5. And as we may notice, uh, something like c6 doesn't really help because it is the defense of the queen only at first glance. In fact, we just capture the queen and pawn on c6 is pinned by the bishop b5. That's the problem. So c6 is not a defense. And this means the only chance to save the queen is to capture the bishop. But after that, as you may notice, we control the d file. And this limits the opponent's king even more. So now rook e1 is even stronger because the king doesn't have a chance to run away. Imagine there is no knight on g8. It could have been just a checkmate uh, in two or three moves. But there is still the knight, so black uh, is still not completely dead. So knight goes to e7. And once again, the same situation. It feels like rook to e7 is something that should be played automatically without thinking because it is so strong we regain the piece that we've just uh, sacrificed after bishop b5. We force the king to super vulnerable and ugly position on f8. But if we take on e7 and king goes to f8, it is really tempting to try to use the power of the bishop a3 now with the help of uh, discovered check. 
But look, if we play rook to e5, which looks very natural to attack the king and the queen simultaneously, black has a defense. It is c7, c5 move covering both the diagonal a3, f8 and the fifth rank. So we don't really win something significant right away. Instead of taking on e7, white decided to start with the rook to b1 move. Very smart attack. Because after rook b1, queen is under pressure and black definitely has to go away somewhere, but appears the queen simply doesn't have a safe square here. So it doesn't really matter where it goes, it will be the target after rook takes e7 for the next discovered check. For example, if queen goes to f5, now after rook e7 check, king f8 and rook to e5, white easily wins. It is check, uh, rook takes f5, follows, and it's over. So the only safe square, in fact, is a6. So queen goes there, and after rook takes e7 and king f8, it's impossible for white to win the queen. But rook to b1 has also another achievement. So now the queen doesn't control the fifth rank, and hence white can use the fifth rank with the queen. Uh, do you remember the principle from the first example? So, the principle of identifying the most vulnerable spot in the opponent's camp, the most vulnerable square around the opponent's skin, and uh, hence just attacking exactly this. So, in this particular case, it is again f7, and uh, we have a great possibility to add the queen to the attack, attacking that square. It is queen to d5 move. Now you can probably uh, completely understand the value of rook to b1 move prior to capturing on e7. So now after queen d5, it's unclear how to protect f7. So the only sensible defense that black has in this situation is queen to c4, but this move doesn't help. Of course, it prevents queen f7 checkmate, but white has another great uh, continuation of the attack. It is rook takes f7, double check. This forces the king somewhere. If king goes to e8, let's say, then white has very simple follow-up. It is rook to e1, and it's over. Everything that black can do here is just to sacrifice all the pieces, but it doesn't help. And uh, another possibility is to put the king on g8, but in this case, white has rook to f8. This square is covered by the bishop. It is a double check, and the king doesn't have a chance to go away anywhere, so it's a checkmate. Now you know the basics of attack against the uncastled king. In a nutshell, prevent the king from running away. Identify the most vulnerable spots. Open up files and diagonals. Don't be afraid of the material imbalance, but care about the coordination of attacking units. Eliminate defenders. Don't waste your time. Be aggressive and quick. Thanks a lot for watching and learning. See you next lessons.